Hey there, great to see you and I hope I find you well. We're on a bargain hunt here in Weir Yard and you are of course invited. I'm Jenny Kirk and we're taking another look at the TMC Summer Sale and uh, two locomotives in particular have caught my eye at 50% of their original RRP. They're A1 locomotives, the new tooled version from Hornby. But if you're thinking Peppercorn and Tornado, that's the wrong A1. Previously, there was another that dates back to the sunset days of the Great Northern Railway and from the uh, engineering drawing board of Sir Nigel Gresley. They were eventually rebuilt into the class that we know as the A3s, and whilst that was going on, the remaining A1s were reclassified as A10s to make space for those peppercorn A1s. And they could have remained just a little bit of a curiosity in history books if it wasn't for the fact that Hornby took on making these as a high fidelity model with a die cast running plate and other die cast fittings, full detail, a really exquisitely yet picked out cab interior, firebox flicker and the full works when it comes to being able to DCC fit it with sound. This is a model which really does need some closer scrutiny and uh, TMC very kindly have uh, sent over a couple of these to the channel for us to get a good close look at. They're in the TMC sale for £126 and change, which is a significant reduction from their well north of £200 original RRP. And they've got them on sale now uh, whilst stocks last. And we do have a link down below in the description box. And courtesy of TMC, they've also sent over one which they said just give this away. So we're going to be doing another giveaway on a forthcoming Monday Club, but stay tuned for the end of the video and I will give you details about that then. But first, are these models worth it even at 50% off RRP? Is this something that should be on your bargain radar? Well, come with me and let's take a closer look in association with Trainomatic, makers of DCT decoders and accessories that are designed by enthusiasts for enthusiasts. Find the full range available to order now at tramfabrique.co.uk. Additional support comes from This is Clark Railworks and this is what we do. You'll know us from Ellis Clark Trains and you'll get the same friendly expertise with us too. We've got a huge range of pre-owned model railways from all your favourite manufacturers and maybe some you hadn't heard of before. It's the place to come for quality. We don't stock substandard models and everything we sell is fully tested and photographed by model railway experts. No matter whether you model double O gauge, N, HO or more, we have sought after models from all around the world with new listings added every weekday. Check out what's available now at ClarkRailworks.com and don't miss out on your latest logo. I'm really excited to take a good close look at these, but first I would like to ask a favour and do please consider hitting the like button, sharing this video to social media and also subscribing if you haven't already done so. And you can also head on over to Patreon and help support the channel to keep making the videos that you want to see with a number of different tiers of rewards. Or you could indeed become a channel member and get a whole host of different rewards for that privilege. And you guys are absolute legends for helping to keep this channel running. But onwards with this Hornby A1 review. Is this a model that you should be really paying closer attention to? Is it one that deserves a place in your fleet? Come with me and let's take a look. Today I'm delving once again into the TMC Summer Sale and these two particular locomotives are the A1 class, the recently retooled versions that came from Hornby with a full die cast running plate, firebox flicker and space in the tender for a DCC installation plus tender pickups. And at the moment these are in the TMC Sale at 50% off RRP which actually makes them £126.50 thereabouts. And of course, don't forget that TMC do post free in the UK for any order over £100. So effectively, the price you see is the price you pay, even if all you buy is a single locomotive. And we do have a link in the description box taking you to TMC to help you find the models featured in today's video. 
Now TMC have very kindly uh, sent over the two different versions they've got in their sale and um, they've gone above and beyond actually because they've sent over a second one of this particular model and we're going to be uh, doing that as a giveaway on a future Monday Club, in fact possibly next week's Monday Club, so do stay tuned for details of that and you will have to watch the Monday Club live to stand a chance of getting this absolutely free courtesy of TMC, but we're getting ahead of ourselves, I will talk a little bit more about that at the end of the video. Now the A1 uh, that's uh, featured here should not be confused with the later Peppercorn A1. Now that has also been produced as a model, but it's a very different locomotive. And if you're confused, well, I'm going to just explain this through for you. The original A1s were a Sir Nigel Gresley design in the twilight years of the Great Northern Railway and were fairly successful, including in the 1925 locomotive exchanges. Um, they actually fared up really, really well against the Great Western Railway locomotives that were featured in the exchange. Over their lives they had a few tweaks and then ultimately they uh, would slowly find themselves being rebuilt into the A3 class. So if you're looking at these and thinking, looks a bit like Flying Scotsman, you'd be pretty much right in that respect because these are the locomotives that became the A3 class that Flying Scotsman was one of. And the unconverted A1s were actually moved to becoming A10s until they were converted to make space for the Peppercorn A1s. Uh, but the two different versions that are available in the TMC sale are Doncaster and Knight of the Thistle. They were in the main named after racehorses and uh, to give you some more details we've got R3990 and this one is Doncaster number 2547 and the second one that uh, we've got here is R3989 and this is Knight of the Thistle number 2564. Now uh, on the box there you can see it's DCC ready with an 8 pin connection so this just comes prior to Hornby upgrading their models for 21 pin interfaces um, but we do get uh, the firebox flicker feature on this uh, so it's still a pretty good model and we will be doing a full DCC fit later on in the video featuring one of the Trainomatic 8 pin decoders and we do have a link in the description box for you to be able to find them from the UK stockist tramfabrique.co.uk but that's in the probably the final third of the video. On the back of the box we've got the information about the A1 class in general and the specific model that features in the box and I do like this that each of these is tailored slightly differently so that you know what the ultimate fate was of the locomotive that you were buying in the box. Let's put Doncaster to one side and let's get on and get this Knight of the Thistle out of the box. So it's just a standard Hornby slipcase and what I will say is I do like the uh, artwork on the front very clear, shows you exactly what you're buying rather than trying to peer through the plastic fantastic inserts so it is something I do quite like with this style of packaging. We've got the paperwork underneath there which will give us the information on maintenance and also how to uh, get into the tender. Inside here we've got the detailing pack and this actually comes in a resealable bag rather than a sealed bag which actually makes it much easier to gain access uh, without um, spraying parts all over the room as you try and rip through a sealed bag. We've also got some uh, details there of where the extra parts go. Uh, most prominent is the brake rigging for underneath the locomotive. But do bear in mind that a lot of these parts you can only fit if you're going to display the model because they will interfere with its ability to get round curves. 
The extra set of wheels here is a rear pony set of wheels and these are flanged and are designed for a drop-in replacement for the flangeless ones that the model is fitted with. The reason it has flangeless is to aid it going around very tight corners that your layout might feature. But if you have something like an end-to-end -end or very generous corners, you can swap it out for the flanged version and we will take a look at that later on. Going into the clamshell, let's just get the model out from here. First impressions are that this model is really, really quite heavy. There's a lot of weight and it feels like it's a lot of low down weight. And uh, I can also tell there, this die cast running plate is really, really substantial and strong. And I, I just think that die cast metal does improve a lot of these models, as well as giving you that adhesive weight. The Doncaster Apple Green is realised really, really well, and let's take a good close look at that lining. It's really quite fine, and we've got the multiple passes there with the white, and then we've got the black in between, and that is really quite crisp. And uh, then we've got the splashes too that are lined out in the white around that Doncaster Green. And I do particularly like too the um, white lining and the green inserts on the wheels. It's a particularly striking combination and certainly works to set off the motion of this model pretty well. The Walshutz Valve Gear 2 is really quite fine. We've got the cast metal crosshead slide and that makes this really quite durable and the correct fluted coupling rods on there to the exact proper profile and um, just moving it backwards and forwards on the slack on the mechanism and it does look to be a nice slick design and we will be looking at that closely as it runs later on. Looking at the rest of the uh, detail paintwork embellishments, we've got that um, works plate there on the smoke box side that's printed on and that really is quite fine. In the viewfinder of the camera, I'm actually, I can't read it, but it looks like it's probably very legible. And it'd be interesting to see that up close with the macro lens later on. We've also got some of the additional pipework and accoutrements underneath the smoke box. And that is really, really quite nicely done. We've got the correct air gap underneath the boiler. And that decoration does look to continue all the way round and under. Name plates are uh, factory attached and again crisp and sharp. We've got uh, Knight of the Thistle. Just looking there at the end, um, I don't know whether that's just a little bit of overspray. It's difficult to tell, but it's not really a great issue. Those splashes are done really, really well and they do line up with the wheels. I also like this uh, S-shaped curve that's in the running plate which captures the look of the prototypes really really well and then we've also got that characteristic Doncaster firebox where the top is flush and uh, really can't be easily distinguished from the curve of the tapered boiler but then the bottom flares out in this really quite uh, ergonomically pleasing line and then you can see there we've got the boiler washout plugs again lined around just like the prototype all of the boiler handrails are metal and they are actually pretty substantial and um, feel nice and well in there there's no risk of them coming free by the feel of it something that has plagued earlier models from various manufacturers in the cab we've got the flush glazing at the front and just turning it around so you can see the cab front, we've got that characteristic, quite complex shaped cab window very accurately portrayed. And certainly these are um, designs that are very reminiscent. I think that Gordon from Thomas the Tank Engine may well have been based on the design of the uh, A1, later A3 class locomotives. Looking on the other side there, again, we've got that really crisp reproduction of the drop shadow lettering. And that is something that is really quite hard to get right. And it does look every bit just like the prototype. You can see there we've got multiple colours. 
with the uh, front face, as it were, of those numbers in the gold colour, but then picked out with red, white and black on the drop shadowing, and that really does make them almost leap from the paintwork, although they are completely flat to the side, and of course on the real locomotive they were painted on. We've also got that uh, straight and true lining. I do love the way it's picked out around the uh, windows on the cab. We've got again metal handrails underneath, more metal handrails, and they're very very robust. Underneath we've got additional pipe work, which I suspect might be for the blower, uh, for there to be a control in the cab. And then we've got the uh, safety valves on the top there, these are turned brass and a whistle which uh, again feels like metal so that is quite robust on the cab roof we've got the poseable hatches and these would have been to allow ventilation for the crew as required and these can be posed in whichever position that you wish looking inside the cab we've got a huge wealth of detail separately applied and separately finished as well all the pipework is picked out and there's a number of different colours in here. It's not just one quick pass, we've got a lot going on. Separately applied wheels and again the gauges feature numerals and needles there. So that needle's even pointing to uh, what the boiler pressure would be and uh, it looks pretty accurate for what the boiler pressure should be for operation of this locomotive. That really is an incredible amount of detail. We've got the uh, forward and reverse gear on a screw handle it looks like in there and I can just about make out the firebox flicker uh, very very discreetly placed inside the uh, fire hole as well. The in rest of the inside of the cab finished in black Although we do get a little bit of that glazing visible on the inside, a little bit of a shame, but again, this is a very cruel magnification. You're not going to be looking this close, and arguably those gauges are uh, something that uh, most people would never see unless you took it off the track like this, but it's nice to know that they're in there. I do like the water gauges as well with their uh, chevrons behind, and that is exactly as per the prototype. The reason for the uh, chevrons behind the water is because of the optical effect you get when you view a shape through water or through air. And that means that the water level is very visible at a glance because you can see where the distortion changes on that chevron pattern and that is the sole reason that they are like that if you ever look inside the cab of any steam locomotive or steam road locomotive. Looking at the front we've got that characteristic front face, the Doncaster dished smoke box door and all of the hinges and the smoke box dart all picked out in silver. This is very much a top link express. We've got the uh, vacuum standard factory fitted and again more crisp and clear multi-tampo pass finished printing on that front buffer beam. Looking to the buffers themselves, these are very very fine turned brass heads and they are sprung as well with a multi-stage shank which matches the look and feel of the prototype. The pony truck is centrally sprung and there is a lot of detail on that casting and that is a metal casting which gives this a lot of low down weight and should help this uh, front bogey wheels to ride the tracks properly. Again we've got the uh, lining on there, there's no sign of a wobble when I move those by hand and that really is so nicely done. Now looking to the fronts of the cylinders, these are picked out in silver and there's no compromise here, there's no compromise needed because that fits quite neatly between the wheels as that moves all the way from side to side. So we don't need a cutout to accommodate the uh, train set curve running. On the front we've got these uh, guard irons, although that does seem to still have a little bit of the legacy of older tooling the way that that's screwed in, but I suspect 
that that is where you would screw in a front coupling. So there is some degree of backwards compatibility for those for whom a front coupling very much is a must. Looking on the underside, we've got all driving wheel pickup featuring the sprung phosphor bronze uh, springs. And they do seem to be touching the wheels where they need to. Although I think I do need to just adjust that back one, but that should be quite easy to do. Again, that looks all right. And again on the front, so it's six wheel pickup from the locomotive. These are the flangeless uh, rear pony wheels done to aid it getting around uh, tighter corners than the prototype would ever be asked to go around. But if they are a deal breaker for you, don't worry, because as we said before, there is a flanged set to swap in. The reason for this is because the rear pony truck setup was actually very different from what you might expect from uh, earlier tooled models. On the prototypes, these didn't have that swing out with the full frames moving from side to side, but rather they were more of a Cartosi arrangement. And this is the compromise that Hornby have gone for to be able to have the flexibility for this to get around your layout in all areas, but also retain that lack of air gap through underneath the cab which can really just break the prototypical accuracy of earlier models. So it's nice to see there that that has been done. I also like the black finish. It's a satin black, so it's got a shine, which you would expect from oily painted metalwork, but it's not gloss, it's not overpowering in its shine. And then we've got that really quite wonderful understated red lining there around the axle box cover and up and over the axle boxes too, which is really nicely done. Plus that central boss of the spring too is correctly picked out. When it comes to the brakes, we've got the blocks in and correctly lined up really quite close to the wheel treads and certainly overlapping the flange. And that is really quite nicely done. We've got flexible uh, sand pipes. These feel like they're metal. Just watch out that these don't catch though, because these could cause uneven running if they were to bend down and start to jam in your track. Although on the model, as it comes out of the box, they are absolutely fine. We've got the correct profile on the cylinders with the valve chest at the top and the cylinder itself bulging out at the bottom. Looking to the tender again, the sharp lining continues here and the LNER again has that multi-colour drop shadowing with the red, the white and the black, really bringing this lettering alive. On the frames we've got a continuation of that satin black and the very understated but effective red lining that brings this model alive. Brake rigging on the tender is factory applied and looking underneath this is something that Hornby do particularly well. The semi-permanently coupled coupling between tender and locomotive has additional holes to allow for close coupling, should you so desire, but you have to physically undo those screws to do that, and that means I can literally dangle the locomotive by the tender without any risk of the coupling coming undone and putting immense strain, risking breaking the connector that goes from tender to locomotive. And I think that this is the best design and it's a shame that other manufacturers that utilize a tender drawbar such as this don't have a safe system that protects that cable and I've seen too many where it's easy for the tender to become uncoupled and put all the stress of the train onto those wires. Turning it up we've got these uh, greedy rails around the side. These feel like they're molded in plastic, I'm not sure actually, it's a very robust plastic. And then we've got a plastic coal insert, which is removable, revealing the full coal hopper inside that you can put real crushed coal and actually have this locomotive anywhere from nearly out to absolutely brimming. And certainly that is a great feature. But for those who aren't really too bothered, the plastic insert does have quite a pleasing effect there and you can see it's got that glisten that a lot of coal has with the um, 
very, very compact, shiny bits. Anthracite particularly does this, but this would, of course, be running on finest Yorkshire coal. And that is actually a really great effect. And it is quite a robust coal insert. So for anybody who's quite happy with that, including me, we just push that back into place and all is well with the world. The rest of the tender top is uh, nicely detailed. We've got uh, the filler on the back, the uh, lifting eyes. Again, they look really, really good. I'm just looking there. Those look like they might be molded, but that is some of the best molding of uh, things like lifting eyes that I've ever seen. That is actually really, really good. And then looking to the front of the tender, we've got that separately fitted handbrake standard. And then the front picked out in green. We've got another works plate up there near the top. Perfectly legible, even though that is tiny. You're seeing it many times actual size there on your screen. And then that uh, ellipse of uh, the white lining picked out on top in black really does look good. And then we've got the hooks for some of the tools, things like a shovel to help the fireman just move the coal if necessary. And all in all, we've got an incredible package here. Moving that one to one side, I've got the other locomotive out. And again, we've got a similar high standard of detail and uh, fitting of bits and pieces. What's interesting is that I've just noticed that there's an extra piece on this one, which uh, isn't on this one. And I'm guessing that they have... Let's just see, is there... It doesn't appear to be... Um, any hole or anything and certainly it looks to me like I'm guessing maybe they have been working from photographs to get subtle detail differences between different members of the class. Again we've got that uh, four colour drop shading really nicely done at the 2547 and again another interesting difference there we've got the um, uh, like teak coloured window surround on this particular model both sides which is not replicated on this one instead this one is in green and it's little details like that which really show that uh, there's a lot of thought gone into each of the different members of the class to make sure that we don't get any issues with uh, bits and pieces that are uh, wrong again we've got the red lining on these radiuses on the front, or should I say radii, radius? Radii, well, it is a Latin word. So again, slight detail differences that really do bring this particular model alive. And of course, this is the model that we're going to be giving one away, courtesy of TMC. I'm just gonna look on the back there. Again, we've got sprung buffers, factory fitted vacuum standard, We've got separate metal lamp irons, straight and true lining, that really does look good. And uh, forgot to point out on the last one, we've got the slimline tension lock coupling fitted there. So you can change that for a different coupling of choice. Tender wheels, single spoked, really nice with the chemical blackening. And we've also got tender pickups as well in place to really improve the reliable running of this model. All in all, I'm really quite impressed by these. LNER liveried locomotives aren't something that feature extensively in my collection, but these really are a beautiful pair. And having them both here to compare to each other really does bring home how much attention to detail goes into actually making sure that there's tiny little detail differences between different members of the class are captured perfectly in these models. Come now to the DCC fitting and I'm going to use one of the DCC Concepts Loco servicing cradles just to protect the model. I'm just going to put that in there and then the uh, bit that we really are concerned with is the tender. So first up I'm going to just very very carefully lever out the coupling with a flathead screwdriver and that just protects that webbing from getting damaged. And that then exposes the hole which I can then take my crosshead screwdriver and you'll find the screw at the bottom and just take that out. And it's quite a long screw, put that to one side safely. 
and then take this out, put that down to one side, and the tender top just uh, comes out, and that exposes the DCC socket there. And we've also got plenty of space for a speaker for a sound installation if you wish to go down that route. Just very, very carefully lever out the blanking plug and then taking the uh, Trainomatic 8 pin decoder. We're looking for the little arrow is pin 1. Match that up with the orange and then line up the pins and a firm but gentle wiggle and the plug goes in. And I'm actually, because this isn't a sound installation, I'm going to use that space there quite carefully just to tuck the decoder out of harm's way. Let's get the uh, wires on top there as well. And then we can hook in, drop down the tender top. And then let's just make sure that that is in and locked down. And then it's simply a case of reinserting the screw. Don't over torque it because you'll just end up stripping the thread and the coupling slots right back in. Make sure you get that the right way up. And there you have it. Quick, easy, simple. Anybody can do that. As you can see on the underside, the brake rigging went in really quite easily, just slotting into the bottom of the brake block assembly. I'm now going to show you exactly how to change this axle. And I've got a flanged axle here. And you're just going to need one of the uh, crosshead screwdrivers. There's a single screw just here. I'm just going to carefully undo that. This removes the keeper plate. Make sure you don't lose that. And then we can very carefully take out the flangeless axle and replace it with the flanged one from the accessory detail pack and this just drops down into that groove. There is a little bit of a degree of lateral movement so you're alright with some curves just this won't go around really tight curves on your layout. So this is definitely one to do if you have an end-to-end -end layout or one with very, very gentle curves. We put that screw back in and we've now got our flanged rear pony truck wheel. When it comes to running, both locomotives perform equally well. What's quite pleasing is when we've got them running, the uh, lining on the wheels is absolutely true, so we don't get any appearance of wobbles, which is certainly something which I always look out for when you have this complex ring lining on the wheels, and Hornby have excelled themselves with these particular models. Running is smooth, and uh, with the die-cast chassis, these locomotives have an awful lot of pulling power. I had them running with some quite long Mark 1 coach trains over the gradients of Weir Yard and they handled this without even breaking a sweat and what's clear is that they could have pulled an awful lot more and certainly far exceeded what the average modeler would be looking to tax them with. They handled the main lines of Weir Yard with exceptional ease and what impressed me was that the flanged rear pony truck wheel coped exceptionally well. I actually thought that I might have had issues, but certainly on a layout with the kind of curves that Weir Yard has, these locomotives were quite happy to have the flange wheel in place, and that certainly improved the posture of the locomotive when going round the curves. The only potential issue that I found was that the firebox glow, whilst incredibly effective, appears to be linked to the locomotive running and that means that the moment you stop the locomotive it goes out and the moment you start the locomotive it comes on. There appears to be no other means of controlling it even if I work through all of the different function keys or the headlight button on the controller and that is something that is just a little bit of a disappointment that Hornby didn't make use of the auxiliary functions to get independent control of the firebox flicker. That said, the colour and flicker of this really is quite a pleasing effect 
and it isn't really a great issue as the locomotive thunders round the track. So we come to the scores, and first up is build quality, and certainly these handled all of my rough handling really quite well in the review, and as you can see, you could even, if you're feeling daring, dangle it from the tender, and there's no real problems with it. It um, just defies any of my rough handling, and I really like the uh, thoughtful use of different materials, including that die-cast running plate, which has gone together to produce a pretty robust locomotive. The only area that I had one little issue with was that the dome on one of the locomotives did come off out of the box, but I'm going to put this down to just being one of those things from manufacturing, and a tiny dab of glue certainly fixed that. The other locomotive was absolutely perfect out of the box with no issues whatsoever. And all in all, I found this to be a pretty reasonable locomotive offering from Hornby with some really great choices of materials to make sure that the model is pretty strong and yet faithful to the prototype. And I'm going to give it a 9.1. When it came to running quality, these models performed exceptionally well, in fact exceeding expectations here on Weir Yard. Even with the flanged pony wheel in place, it handled the entirety of Weir Yard without issues arising, and that actually was far better than I was expecting. I'd been led to believe that the flanged wheels were pretty much for display only, but what this proves is that if you've got more generous curves on your layout, it's well worth swapping out that rear pony truck wheel, and it's great that Hornby provide you with this spare to cover all bases. They handled some long trains of Mark I coaches pretty well over the gradients of Weir Yard, and there was no signs of slipping or struggling, and I'm quite confident that they would have handled a lot more if I'd have taxed them as well. So all in all, I'm going to give them a 9.8 out of 10. On DCC fitting and innovation, well, let's break that down into the two different parts. DCC fitting was remarkably easy, with just that single screw to open up the tender, and then in turn there's plenty of space inside, including thought given for a DCC sound installation. On innovation, I like the fact that they're providing you with the firebox flicker, and the flicker itself is exactly the right colour, and the flickering does seem pretty authentic. But it does seem to be a missed opportunity that Hornby didn't put that onto a specific auxiliary function such that you could then control it on DCC. Of course, for DC users, it's going to be on all the time anyway, but on DCC, it just seems that they missed a trick in not allowing that to be controlled and it only coming on when the locomotive is running with no choice to be able to turn it off. So I'm going to give this a 9.0 out of 10. On accuracy and quality of finish, well, accuracy, I don't see any real faults, and I must admit that I really like the differences between these two locomotives, ostensibly the same class of locomotives, but they've got subtle detail differences in the livery application and some of the fine detail that match these to their specific prototype counterparts. And I really like that attention to detail, which I suppose would only really show up when you have both of these side by side. So I'm going to give this a 9.5 helped by that lining on the wheels that is micron perfect. I really did like that. It makes or breaks a model if that lining is even a small amount out because it just starts to wobble and draw the eye, which we didn't get with either of these models. On value for money, at the moment these are on offer from TMC for just a shade over £126. And in this day and age, for a high-spec model, that also includes die-cast running plates, amazing haulage capacity, full provision to be able to fit sound into the tender, and all the bells and whistles and fine accoutrements of detail that you would expect, it really does go in to make a great model. At 50% off the RRP, the TMC sale, and they will stay at that price, I'm led to believe, until they are sold out, really is an opportunity that isn't going to come round again. 
The original RRP might have been a little bit on the expensive side for a lot of people, being well north of the £200 mark, but in this 50% offer, that really does up the value for money. And I'm going to give this a 9.0, reflecting its original RRP, and the price that you can now find it at, at the link in the description box down below. And that gives us a grand total of 46.4. A really respectable score for what is actually a really great model. These are prototypes that quite easily could have been consigned to history. After their rebuild into A3s, the original A1s might have been forgotten, but in model form, Hornby really have delivered something special. I hope you really enjoyed today's video and found it informative, and we've got that link for you down in the description box taking you to the TMC Summer Sale, where you can pick up both of the locomotives featured at that sale price. And I'd love to hear from you in the comments section down below, what did you think about the model featured today? And if you really want to be in with a chance of getting yourself one of these absolutely free, well TMC have very generously given us a one to give away. Yeah, just give away. Free. It'll just arrive on your doormat and you'll be like, oh, that's nice. And uh, well, what you have to do is watch next week's Monday Club, which runs from 7 p.m. UK time uh, for two hours. And you have to watch live to be in a chance with winning. If you watch it on catch up, you'll have already missed the draw. We will ask three questions throughout the show and you'll need to then send the answers to those three questions. It needs to be the correct answer in one email. Don't do the thing where you send the answer one at a time. It's got to be all three together to the address that is given at the start of the Monday Club, and we will update you throughout just in case you missed the start. And you too could be the proud lucky owner for nothing of one of these glorious A1s, courtesy of TMC, so do check that out. And the best way of being aware of when the Monday Club's on is to hit the subscribe button and ring the notification bell to make sure that you're the first to know when that goes live. But until next time, this is me, Jenny Kirk, saying please like, share and subscribe. Also check us out over on Patreon or indeed become a channel member. And we've got the full merch store down below as well if you want to browse the t-shirts, hoodies and mugs that we have available. But until next time, take great care. Happy modelling. Bye for now. Today's video comes in association with Trainomatic makers of DCC decoders and accessories that are designed by enthusiasts for enthusiasts. Find the full range available to order now at tramfabrique.co.uk. Additional support is provided by This is Clark Railworks and this is what we do. You'll know us from Ellis Clark Trains and you'll get the same friendly expertise with us too. We've got a huge range of pre-owned model railways from all your favourite manufacturers and maybe some you hadn't heard of before. It's the place to come for quality. We don't stock substandard models and everything we sell is fully tested and photographed by model railway experts. No matter whether you model double O gauge, N, HO or more, we have sought after models from all around the world with new listings added every weekday. Check out what's available now at ClarkRailworks.com and don't miss out on your latest logo. I'd like to send out a huge thanks to everybody who supports me on Patreon, but a special thanks go out to Anthony Kidson, Offshore Allen, Michael Lockie, Helen Sink, Gary Lewis, David Quinn, Sparky107107, George Botterini, Chris Moss, Robert Steers, Sam Yates, Dale Williams, John N. from NC, NYMRish, Jonathan Foster, Peter, Clifford Ison, Larry W. Grant, NI Railways 4000 Class, Ian Coulson, Alan Dickerson, Eddie Papair, Karen Nicholl, Medwin Williams, Crossways Point Junction, 3B Rail, Jennifer Horton, Michael Rose, Trains with Nick, and Simon Snow. Thank you. Without you guys, I couldn't do this.